Professor Naga, thank you so much for making the time. You know, you've seen so many political chapters of Ethiopia and the region as a whole. Looking at where things stand now, big picture, you know, what gives you hope about where we are, what concerns you, and what areas do you think Ethiopians really need to work on? When you sit now and look at where society is heading, on the one hand, you can see possibilities where certain things that require a lot of resources to uh, to achieve at the broader scale, at the larger scale, such as in education, for example. The existence of technology has made it a little bit easier and knowledge is spreading across the board insofar as you can make a distinction between what is the right knowledge and what is the wrong kind of knowledge. So the resource requirement for spreading knowledge has relatively reduced, but on the other hand, the requirements of ensuring that the right kind of knowledge is uh, transmitted to the, the, the next generation has become a little bit more difficult. So, so there is an opportunity that this technological change has brought, an opportunity in terms of making certain things unacceptable. Dictatorships are a harder time, I would expect, in, in this kind of environment. But on the other hand, the disruptive aspect of this technological change uh, is going to have serious consequences for uh, for broader society, and I think that's why we are seeing such humongous instability across across the globe. Within democratic societies, uh, you know, the, the old trust between state and government is has seriously eroded because of because of this. Uh, within uh, societies that are that are uh, heterogeneous, uh, the trust level between different uh, groups, categories of people, whether it is in ethnicity and religion and things of that, have become very tenuous and, and very difficult. The old challenges that we have, such as, for example, food self-sufficiency, making, you know, fighting poverty and things of that, are not totally gone. They are still serious problems. But these problems are now magnified because of this, um, uh, this technology and information technology that, that is creating more disruption uh, in society. So it is, it is a very tricky period in my view. Yeah, it looks like it. You know, the peace and the stability in Ethiopia seems so delicate. And one of the recent issues that we saw, um, you know, around the Orthodox Church, there look like there was going to be just some really serious unrest. Is this going to be a cycle? And what can citizens keep in mind? And what does the state have to do to make sure that this peace is actually seen through? In my view, um, our problems, problems related to stability, particularly political stability, in my view, at the deeper level, uh, has come and were consolidated in the last 30 years when uh, our politics, by choice of uh, uh, certain groups, by choice have been made to center around ethnicity. I mean, there has been debates when this was happening, that there were people were warning that this you are opening a Pandora's box. This is something that once you open is going to be very, very difficult to close. Uh, that it is very difficult to, to, to establish a state on the basis of difference rather than on the basis of equality. Because ethnicity is different. Religion is different. Gender is different. I mean, a state cannot be established on the basis of these differences. Once that ideology, uh, as was feared, created more and more difference rather than bringing society together under the TPLF. Once ethnicity starts to be uh, n not only a, an issue of cultural identity, but also a mechanism through which you claim resources from the state. You know, you know, added to that, this, 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 uh, this demographic uh, explosion that has occurred. You know, you, you, you must understand. You have what we have close to seventy percent of the the population is under thirty. What that essentially means is 
close to 70% of the population has grown up in a society where politics is defined by ethnicity and by these differences. Unless we address this squarely, unless we create some kind of social consensus about the basis of what this state is, what is the base of equality that, that made us equal, irrespective of all these other identities that are a base of difference, such as ethnicity, language, religion, etc. I don't know how we can avoid this, this conflict. So how do you do that? I mean, to your point, this politics of difference is really an extreme politics. It eventually leads to the pushing things to the brink, whether it's based on ethnicity or religion. And it looks like, even though in 2018, as you mentioned, Madama was the policy synergy, you know, under one Ethiopia as opposed to ethnicity, it looks like things are getting more entrenched because there are people that are benefiting from it. So how do you scale it back? Is it the Constitution, like some people say? If the goal was to get away from the politics of difference, it doesn't look like we are getting there, at least when you look at it. No, it doesn't. It, it is actually very strange. I mean, after the, this rather disastrous conflict that we went in, which is really made by this politics of ethnicity, you know, the mastermind of this ethnic politics, the TPLF, after leading the people of Tigray into this conflict with hundreds of thousands of youth killed, hundreds of thousands, you would think society would sit down and think, you know, maybe this thing is not working. Maybe this thing is, is dangerous. Maybe we should move into some kind of an alternative arrangement that would not lead us towards this kind of conflict. That's what you think. I mean, it, it seems counterintuitive yeah. to, to dig our heels in or for the people to dig their heels in on ethnicity or even religion after this two-year disaster that we've seen. And yet we are seeing that. So... Are there things like the economy or education that need more consideration in the reconciliation process? I mean, you know, for those of us who are more privileged, we can keep talking about ethnicity is not the way, you know, we should be more unified, but it appears there are some economic yeah. factors that maybe push people in that direction. Maybe it's a matter of a lack of education. Do you think those are some of the things that are fueling it and also those who are benefiting from it that maybe yeah. are financing it? No, it's two things. I think um, the inability to solve basic economic issues, that poverty is still an issue, unemployment is still an issue, and things of that sort, that has created in this wide demographic group of young people uh, the feeling that they are not properly represented by, by, by the state or um, the, then, of course, it's a very short distance from that to the next step, which is if it was my ethnicity, then I could have benefited from it because um, that creates, that becomes a, a very important uh, impetus for, um, for uh, instability. Whereas why it is for the elites who have been benefiting for the last 30 years from ethnic politics, whether in, uh, you know, in business, in, uh, uh, through government uh, uh, positions and corruption and things of that sort, the end of this becomes a threat to their interest. Therefore, they will be very happy to finance any kind of conflict so that this thing is not stable. Because if it is stable and starts to move in the right direction, to move towards a politics of equality or uh, a politics that considers the, the, the foundation of the state on the basis of what makes us equal, then they, they can be they can feel threatened. Or oh, if this thing if if our future politics is going in that direction, so the way to stop it is to create this instability. And these are resources. They have they have sufficient resources. They are they are people um, a, a good number of them in in government uh, at the regional level at least. Uh, they have security apparatus with with the Liu Hiles and the special forces in every region. You know, this is a country that ethnic groups have their own army, they have their own media, they have their own economic uh, uh, zone. You know, this, I mean, the system has created this incredible infrastructure 
that makes it very difficult to create a larger polity uh, uh, on the basis of equality. So when they disrupt it, they are not disrupting it as some, some small group of uh, uh, young people uh, creating havoc. It is all these institutions are, to a certain degree, operating closely to each other. That's why you see in some of the conflicts, the Liu Hai just simply sides, irrespective of whether it is legal or uh, legal right or wrong, whether it brings peaceful, uh, just side with your ethnic group, no matter what their issue is. We saw it in this religious conflict. We, show, we saw it in uh, the, the previous conflicts in Urlaga and in other places. We saw it in Tigray. The, the, the Tigray fight was because of this Liu Hai that the TPLF has created a state within the state. Um, that's why it is very difficult. That's why it is, it is at once extremely sensitive that you have to go carefully about. But on the other hand, unless otherwise you do something, something really radical and uh, uh, put in the minds of these people that that system is going to go, uh, it's going to be a very difficult problem to solve. As you speak about the system, the, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is the Constitution yeah. as being the foundation of the system. A lot of people say that is what needs to change and that will be where the solution comes from. Do you think that is the answer or is it more complicated than that? No, I mean, there is no question about the fact that what the TPLF has done is it put its ideology as a constitution of a nation. Article 47 specifically allows each nation, nationality, and people to establish its own region at any time. At any time. All it has to do is get that ethnic group to get together and, and vote. And the rest, others don't have any business, neither does the uh, uh, federal government. You know, there, there are indications that some regions are moving towards exercising that right in different ways. So why are we not, why is the country not moving towards changing the constitution? Is there a reason? No, that, so up to now, in the last four years, the, that discussion has, has been around. It was, has been on the air. Um, but there has never been an, an institutional mechanism through which this discussion was going to take place. Now, this is the National Dialogue Commission is supposed to actually achieve that. Where do you think stand with the Reconciliation Committee? I mean, people are wondering where is the conversations that we were expecting to have, some of the ones that you explain. I mean, is, are things moving? The commission that is organizing this National Dialogue, they said they are uh, more or less uh, developing the agenda that uh, for the discussion and that then the discussion is going to start and things of that sort. So, so I'm hoping it would it would start soon. I want to get your thoughts on the Ethiopian Eritrea relationship before we shift towards education. I mean this is also a relationship that has seen many chapters. Uh, you as one of the co-founders of Gunboat 7 operated out of and with um, Eritrea we've seen the two countries be at war with each other, groups within both countries working together, and then now in this latest uh, war with the TPLF working together against that group. So where does the relationship between Ethiopia and Eritrea stand, and how do you see that relationship in the future as it relates to the greater Horn of Africa and its stability? I mean, I, I, uh, I really hope um, that a peaceful, stable, cooperative relationship would develop between not only Eritrea and Ethiopia, but between Ethiopia and Somalia, between Ethiopia and Kenya, the whole region. This is time to start thinking broadly about our position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the change that, that I see is taking place globally in terms of the power structures and power struggles. You know, I, I always tell my friends that uh, the Cold War was between the Soviet Union and the United States, primarily, right? Maybe Western Europe aligned with the United States and Eastern Europe with the Soviet Union. But most of the fight, most of the blood was spilled 
in Africa and in Asia. I mean, people were, that issue was not really fundamentally their issue. When you have big powers that can, that want to rule beyond their, their, uh, uh, beyond their regions or the global level, they see the rest of the world as pawns that they're, they are playing with. And the way they do it is by creating hostility and conflict within, within us. Maybe these were conflicts or issues that existed before, but they deliberately play around those and let us, you know, go at each other rather than collectively work towards addressing some of the, the, the most thorny issues that we are facing. Why are we starving? Why, should, why shouldn't we feed ourselves? Why don't we cooperate to, uh, to produce uh, and be food, food self-sufficient? Why don't we fight poverty together? Why do we waste our resources in uh, you know, fighting against each other? That is the broader framework that I see uh, the relationship between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Eritrea has ports. We need ports. We can cooperate economically so that we benefit and they benefit. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the as a port, it is, if it does not serve Ethiopia, I don't know who is going to use it. And, there is a very uh, big room to work together to actually uh, for the benefit of both, both communities. And I, I, I honestly believe this to be true with our Somali uh, brothers uh, on the other side of the border, or Djibouti and with the others. To your point about outside interference fueling conflict within the region, Eritrean President Esaias Afwerki recently did an interview saying that the last two years of war was more of a U.S. or Washington agenda than it was um, a TPLF uh, cause. And this issue of the U.S.-Ethiopia relationship as a long-term ally continues to come up. So how do you see the relationship between the U.S. and Ethiopia moving forward? Um... I mean, first, if you ask me, I mean, I, 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 I have to admit, um, um, I was totally uh, taken aback by um, the United States' position with regards to the conflict. Uh, and to a certain degree, Western Europe also uh, uh, supported that position. The level of hostility through which they saw the Ethiopian government uh, in relation to the conflict, irrespective of all the evidence about who started this conflict, why did they start it, um, it was it was extremely strange to say the least. U.S. policy uh, was extremely hostile to the Ethiopian government's position at the time, and I found it to be very strange because I I, I haven't noticed anything from the Ethiopian government side that indicates that this long-term hostility towards the United States. Um, you, you know, my, at, at that time I was not in government, but my conversations with uh, people in government, at that time they, they still see America as a very important friend and ally. And uh, so everybody was wondering what has happened. And, there was some suspicion that this might have something to do with Isaias. Uh, because Isaias has always been uh, dismissive of the West and he, was, uh, he is not someone that gets anything from the West. He doesn't care about getting anything in terms of economic support and things of that sort. Um, I think starting from the Ethio Eritrean War of uh, the, the last conflict. So that hostility that the United States showed to to Ethiopia and the Ethiopian government was a bit strange. And I think, uh, from what I'm hearing, uh, since I was traveled to Washington for the Africa Summit, some of it is being mended. From that, what I see is, I don't think there is any interest in, uh, uh, in being hostile to the United States. Ethiopia is a poor country. It has a lot of homework to do. Uh, it has to feed its population, it has to uh, attract as much investment as, as possible to feed its population and to create employment and create stability. Then whatever country can, uh, can support that, 
whatever relationship with countries can support that, then then Ethiopia can't afford to say, no, 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 I'm, I'm on this category of countries or the other. And, uh, and I think it's not just Ethiopia. Most Africans are realizing that they have paid dearly from the Cold War and they are not going to go into uh, supporting war or the other in this new emerging thing. And I think, I think that is a good policy in my view. Great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your work as Minister of Education, but first we'll take a really quick Finally. break. Finally. So I want to talk a little bit about your work as Minister of Education. Recently, the 12th grade national exam results came out. Only 3.3% of students passed that exam. It was about 48% last year. What were the factors that showed these results? So the issue of education and what happened to the Ethiopian education system in the past 20, 25, 30 years is directly related to, at least in my view, to the issue of instability that we started at this, this interview with. Um, the decline of trust within society, the inability to reason, to um, to to think of this society as part of your society that you have to think about its it is uh, its peace its long term stability and what have you and the um, I mean the the basic moral construct that we all have as individuals where we make a distinction between right and wrong. You know, all that is partly a product of the education system. It is what you teach your children that is going to come back and bite you. So the Ethiopian education system has produced for a long time um, students with a very low quality of education. The education system itself um, it has expanded significantly. There is no question about it. So access to education has become a very important issue. Governments were trying to expand education uh, uh, quite rapidly, actually. But this education did not come with the necessary quality that provides you with the, the, um, the skills necessary to improve your life or to create your own uh, you know, to attempt uh, at uh, creating your own work or, or what have you. But it's not just in terms of skills, even in terms of the ability to reason, to reason at a higher level that would allow you to, to be a contributing member of a changing, technically and technologically changing societies, they were very, very ill-prepared. We all knew this. This, this, is not, this was not a mystery. When, when uh, I became Minister of Education, um, in fact, before I was, I was appointed, you know, I made it clear uh, that uh, the focus of any uh, Ministry of Education now is how to improve the quality of education. Uh, so when we came, the first thing that we did was we kind of started to study where are the problems, what, what are the key issues that the system is facing that make it produce such low quality education. We didn't audit it yet. We have all kinds of data indicating that the quality of education has gone significantly down. It is a generally accepted uh, story within society that education quality has what were the points of data? Was it the cheating or corruption? No, no, or? no. That is an addition. That's an addition problem. It is. It is starting from teacher quality, infrastructure of uh, schools. Um, you know, we we evaluated our our schools uh, from one to four, stage one to four, where four is a decent school that is fit for education, and ninety. Um, one and two are totally, you know, 
these are places that you cannot really even call schools, close to 90% are in the category of one and two. Right? We have close only about 10% that you mildly can is in category three. Almost none in category four. There is no water, there is no electricity, you know, there is no uh, running water available for girls to, you know, for hygienic purposes. Uh, then the quality of uh, teachers has gone down significantly. The, um, uh, of course, the, the, the basic incentive that is given for teachers in terms of salary and things of that sort has gone down. Um, there was too much political interference in the education sector. You know, most principals were appointed for their political uh, connections more than for, uh, for their ability. So, so, so there are this host of problems that we're seeing. And we have, there are some, some data we have seen. You know, the, 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 the attendance rate of teachers in Ethiopian schools, and not necessarily just going to school, but going and teaching in classes, was under 50%. I mean, it, 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 it was just crazy. I mean, we just look at it and say, there is no way that we can. Then, of course, the question becomes, we also know that all this education quality deterioration, to it is added this moral collapse. You know, this uh, cheating is rampant. I'm not talking about cheating in classes, but even in national exams. And cheating not... Uh, done by individual students in class, it's organized by regions to allow uh, uh, you know, their ethnic uh, folk to pass the, compared to others. I mean, it is, it is, it literally has fallen apart. I mean, in, you know, when you... So we, we try to identify, okay, what are the key issues that we have to handle? What, you know, what the... Uh, you know, at, at the broadest possible level. So we started by identifying four key critical issues that are bedeviling the, the education system. One, uh, rapid expansion without the necessary concomitant growth in the materials that makes it possible to provide a decent a quality education, whether it is school materials, teachers, and what have you. All you just have to do is just build a few blocks and call it uh, education. Significant deterioration in the quality of teacher training. And um, um, partly because of the, the, the significant political interference in, in the education system. So political interference was considered one of the, 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 the problems and that we have to address to make education as independent as possible from, from education. The third that we identified is uh, ethnic politics and regionalism that has significantly and negatively affected the way education is uh, delivered to, uh, to the children. Most of our universities, which were established in different zones, are the centers of ethnic uh, uh, you know, benefit distribution than, than anything else, rather than the centers of education. You know. uh, it's a place where universal education is to be given. That's what a university is. But each university is more or less uh, uh, so regionally intertwined with the, the uh, corruption and economic benefit that the... the, the the zones get, that this regionalism has really significantly uh, affected the quality of education. And this includes, of course, as I said, stealing exams, national exams, so that their, uh, their kids would pass more than other regions. So we have to do something about that. And finally, this is the moral collapse. Um, you know, this... Uh, this collapse is not only in the education system, but is highly pronounced and its effect is highly negative when it comes to the education system. This attempt to get shortcuts to everything, you know, you can get rich through shortcut by, uh, you know, linking yourself with some government official or another through corruption and things of that sort. So 
hard work, uh, education uh, becomes second. There are all kinds of shortcuts that you can you can uh, make a much better living than some Steve who sits and studies and uh, and works hard. You know. uh, so this moral collapse to identify what is right and wrong, what is acceptable and not acceptable, is cheating and stealing morally acceptable or I mean that that has completely fallen apart. So we identified this and we said, okay, we have to, to work on all these fronts. It's gonna be a long journey, but we have to start step by step by addressing some of the key uh, elements. And one of the first issues that came when we decided uh, to change course was the way the exam is given. We knew, everybody knew that uh, the exams do not at all in any way reflect the capacity of an individual student. It is it's a product of who is cheating more, who is stealing more, and things of that sort. And you can imagine, so if those are the ones that are passing and coming to universities with the limited space that you have, then you are producing, uh, you know, so-called educated uh, youth which is actually not educated at all. Right, and they would have to, naturally, they would have to cheat at the university to Absolutely, get to, to the get, university. to by the university. Right. When they finish the university, they have to go to government offices and, and cheat, cheat to get and through that. steal right. and... Right. This was the system. So the 3% addresses, or the, the way you guys did the test now at federal institutions addresses the issue of uh, stealing tests and corruption. But what is being done to address the issue of bad schools, yeah, unprepared yeah, yeah. teachers, yeah. and everything yeah. else that comes? Absolutely. I mean, so, so what we did with the exam is we decided to audit the system because previously we have the indications everybody knows, but we don't know exactly how much it is, how bad is it? You know, is that, is, are, is there something salvageable about about this? So the way to do it is we said, okay, previously the cheating and the stealing was because the students were taking their exams at their schools. So their word is interested so to pass them because the, the, the head of the, the education bureau at the word level wants to report that his students are so great that they pass at, at a higher level. Same thing with the zones. So this system um, has made it almost impossible to say that the, 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 the examination process has any, any iota of integrity at all. So the first thing is we have to introduce integrity to the system. So we said, we are going to take all the kids out of their uh, comfort zone in their, in their classrooms. And since this is a federal exam, we are going to give them in federal institutions. So we are going to bring them into universities and make sure uh, that the universities themselves are suffering because they are getting bad quality students, therefore the university has also, universities have also deteriorated. So they have an inherent interest in, in making, uh, uh, you know, providing some sense of integrity in the exam. So, so we, we devise this plan to give the exams in the universities. So what that does is there was no exam taken by any region or any group. And, and, and even worse, it has created such a competition between the regions. So this ethnic politics is baked into it too. So, uh, you know, if Amhara region passes more, then say, oh, it is because the Amharas have cheated, or, and if they almost have, I mean, so the whole body politic of the country, which is intertwined to this, this, this ethnic politics, has also made uh, or sacrificed the integrity of the education system. So by doing that, we got all the regional players out of the, the system. But the problem is not only with the regional players, it is with the teachers themselves. Because they didn't teach them much. When they invigilate exams, they allow them to cheat. The schools have an interest in cheating because especially the private schools, if they don't pass a lot of uh, students, then they are not going to be considered good schools. Then, so I mean, the system was just totally, um, amazingly intertwined, but in a bad way. It is just, it is organized for doing something bad rather than something good. So that exam 
was our first attempt to see exactly where, where are we as a country in terms of the education system. So it was an audit. So we gave that exam. We, that, that actually means any grades or any passes in the past have no actual meaning. They, are, they don't reflect whether the students are good or bad. Because they were, we know they were not properly educated, but the, the, the way the exams are, they just ch simply cheated. For the last eight years, matriculation exams were posted in social media before the exams. You, know, you don't even know where they are stolen from. You know, whether it is during print, whether it is once they were being transported to the regions. Anyway. So that's what we did. So when this came, but the few that are good, that are reasonably capable, that studied, showed up. So that's why you have this 3.3% uh, pass rate. It's just that this were the only legitimately uh, tested students. And what we saw, the 3.3, .3 are people who got whatever grade they get, on their own effort and their own capability. That is what is important about this exam. Then the signal that it sends to the rest of society that from now on, for the children, from now on, you are not gonna go to university by cheating or by stealing or by, you study, you study hard, then, then the capable students are gonna go to the universities. That's what we have seen, that's what the exam has done. So now, now that we know the, the, the size of the problem, then we can come up with solutions to this problem. So we have now all kinds of programs to improve the, the infrastructure of schools. We have programs to improve the teacher training uh, procedures and provide some training to the existing teachers uh, themselves. Uh, we have stopped for the last, actually it was started a little bit earlier even than uh, when we came, um, we have stopped hiring principals on the basis of political affiliation. It's completely on, on merit, and we have started this large training program for uh, principals. Uh, we are working with the UK organization to, to develop that. Um, so so we, are, we have this series of uh, change that we, are t that we are implementing in terms of improving quality from the ground up. So knowing the depth of the problem from the education angle, does that change the way that you look at the society and how quickly it needs to change and what actually needs to happen to get it to change? You know, one of the things that has happened when these exam results came out was a shock. Almost everybody, I mean, you know, this is, I mean, since I came here in the last four years, this is probably the first issue that has really maybe a conflict with TPLF and things like that have unified, unified society. But this issue really has touched everybody. And I mean, people thought that, you know, people are going to be mad because students didn't pass. And they, no, society's response was, you know, if this is this bad, you know, we have to do something about it. This, this, we cannot just, uh, continue to play politics with the future of our children. Um, so everybody is now um, initiated to do something about education. Uh, in fact, we are going to start a campaign for education uh, to improve, for example, schools by the communities themselves. The community should own or should be part of the school system. Um, we have some 47,000 schools. Most of them are not really what you might reasonably call schools in the proper sense. So the community, former students from that, those places, the diaspora has to contribute to improve the basic infrastructure because that's one of the issues where students would go and they don't find an attractive place to learn. We are gonna start this massive uh, retraining of teachers so that uh, you know, by giving them additional short-term training, then we can improve the quality of teachers. And we want to involve the public in this. We want to involve the public in terms of the, the moral education of our children, starting from the family.
parents have to be part of this, and they have to improve the the, the moral education in the, you know within, within their their own families. That is the kind of society that we need to build, and education is at the center of it all, and that's why we are. Um, we believe what we are going to do in the education system is as important as anything that we are going to do in this country that will build our future, that would put us in an even kill uh, to face this challenging future that we are facing as a society. It's a big task. It is a big <laughs> it's task. A big task. There is no question about it. Certainly wish you and the, you know everyone in the country well. I know you have a really busy schedule, and so I really appreciate that you've made the time. Professor Brahanu Nega, Minister of Education for Ethiopia, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure.